Welcome to the opening event of the Democracy Matter series, and thank you all for joining us. I'm Rana Bramitsky, a professor of economics here at Stanford and the senior associate dean of the social sciences. This is the first of nine events. Over the next few weeks, I will be hosting 39 Stanford faculty who will weigh in on challenges facing the US as we approach the elections. Each week will be dedicated to a different topic, ranging from healthcare and the economy to racial injustice and immigration policy. The entire Stanford community is welcome, and I'm very happy to say that we have a thousand participants today, staff members, students, faculty, postdocs, and alumni. I also want to welcome the many non-Stanford participants who are watching the live stream of today's event. I got to say that putting together these events, I was reminded of the amazing talent, scholarship, and knowledge we have here at Stanford. There are so many other scholars and so many other topics that I could have added, and I hope I will uh, in the future. Today in the opening event, we are going to have a discussion about challenges facing democracy with four very distinguished colleagues. Uh, Condoleezza Rice, director of the Hoover Institution, unfortunately couldn't be here in person today, so I met with her earlier and pre-recorded our conversation for you. We will only show a shortened version today, but we will post the full conversation afterward. We do have with us today Larry Diamond, senior fellow at FSI and Hoover, Margaret Levy, director of the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, and Mariano Florentino Cuellar, justice of the Supreme Court of California and a former law professor uh, here at Stanford. So this should be a really great event. Uh, each speaker will give a presentation and we will follow with Q&A from the audience at the end. You can just use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to send us your questions and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as time permits. Before I introduce our guest speakers today, I, I want to thank the great staff members at the Dean's Office, especially Joy Layton and Ellie Maldonado, as well as Stephanie, Natalie, Philly, Fawn, John, Sandra, and others for their hard work that made this event series possible. We really have the best staff members here at Stanford. I also want to thank the wonderful Deborah Satz, Dean of the School of h &S for her terrific support. Uh, I invited Deborah to speak at the event on income inequality, so I will introduce her more formally then. For now, let me just say that Deborah is an inspiration to all of us. And Deborah, I, I would love it if you could say a few words before we start. Thanks, John. And I just want to welcome everybody and say how incredibly excited I am about uh, this uh, uh, initiative class uh, project that Ron has really ran with uh, and which showcases the incredible talent that we have in the school, the incredible faculty, and also does something I'm very committed to, which is reasserts uh, front and center our public uh, mission and that we are a public good, that we are creating research that, um, among many other kinds of research, speaks uh, to uh, public problems. And uh, I'm, I'm just delighted by this and delighted by um, the community coming together around this. So thanks to Ron and thanks to everybody for participating. Thanks, thanks a lot, Deborah. And now, without further ado, I bring to you Condoleezza Rice. Hello, and thank you very much for joining my conversation with Condoleezza Rice. Over the next few weeks, I'm going to talk with many Stanford faculty on some of the deep challenges facing the US as we approach the elections like racial injustice, income inequality, uh, and immigration. But uh, before we are going to delve into each of these important topics in the coming weeks, I thought it would be wonderful to, to get to ask Condoleezza some uh, big picture questions. Uh, Condoleezza, of course, has a unique perspective on some of these challenges as someone who is both a Stanford professor and served at the highest levels of government. Uh, Condoleezza is a chaired professor of political science at Stanford, a real expert on Russia and the Soviet Union. She is also a former national security advisor and secretary of state. And we are very fortunate at Stanford that Condoleezza has just started as the new director of the Hoover Institution. So thank you very much, Condi, for joining me this morning. It's a pleasure to be with you, Fran, very much. 
uh, there will be many students listening to our conversation. So I wanted to start maybe with asking you advice for students as they decide what to study or what to research. So I wanted to ask you, why did you decide to study Russia and what advice do you have for, for students? Well, my advice is very much like yours, which is that you have to do something that really energizes you and that you love. But of course, the first thing that energized me was to be a concert pianist. So I was actually a failed piano major when I found the Soviet Union. I'd studied piano from the age of three. I was going to uh, be a great concert pianist. At the end of my sophomore year in college, it suddenly occurred to me that I was pretty good, not great. I was probably going to end up teaching 13-year-olds to murder Beethoven for a living. And so fortunately for me, Ron, I walked into a course in international politics looking for a major. It was taught by a man named Joseph Corbell. He was Madeleine Albright's father, oddly oh. enough. And uh, he was an East European former diplomat, and he opened up this world to me of the Soviet Union and things international and diplomatic. And I thought, that's what I want to be. I want to be a specialist in international politics. And I would just say two things about that lesson to the students. The first is finding something that you're absolutely just thrilled to get up and want to do in the morning. That's really the key, I think, to a happy professional life. The other point is, it's your passion. Don't let anybody tell you that because you look a particular way or you come from a particular background, why in the world should a black girl from Birmingham, Alabama want to be a specialist on international politics in the Soviet Union? But it was my passion. And so um, I think you have to, yes, you said, you have to go with your heart. This is great. And I hear you're quite a good pianist, by the way. So I think you're not doing much justice for yourself <laughs> here. But, you know, let, let's, let's talk about, uh, about income inequality for a second. So. You've done obviously a lot of research on the Soviet Union and spent some time there, if I recall correctly, in your 20s. I know this experience did not make you believe more in socialism, but then we also both know that the free market capitalism isn't a perfect system either. For example, there's a rise in income inequality in the US over the last few decades, and many people are wondering whether we can create a more equal society. Do you think? income inequality is a problem in the US and do you have suggestions of, of how to reduce it? I definitely think that income inequality and social immobility uh, are problems for uh, the United States. Let me first of all uh, speak to the socialist issue. Um, as you know, uh, because you also know these issues as an economist, the, the Marxist notion that it should be from each according to his talents and to each according to his needs, that's only worked at gunpoint. It's only worked when you took people's liberty to do that. And it didn't work very well. It didn't work in the Soviet Union. Uh, people say, well, it's working in China. No, a very different system in China where Deng Xiaoping actually had to go to a more capitalist economic model to be able to bring uh, equality and to bring greater social and income uh, mobility to his own people. So I think we can agree, or I believe, that as a system, uh, capitalism, which incents people uh, to work hard, uh, to be innovative, uh, to create jobs in the private sector, not depending on the government, that's a the best economic system for the allocation of resources so that you get growth. But then you have to have a social contract as to how people are actually going to benefit from the overall macroeconomic conditions. And that's, I think, where we are falling down in the United States. Too many people are trapped in uh, low wage, low skill jobs. Too many people are trapped um, unable to move up the, the ladder. And my view is that what has always made it possible to have uh, income uh, equality, to have social mobility, is access to a high quality education. And today, that access to a high quality education is more important than it's ever been because the skills that it takes to be uh, successful in a highly automated, highly innovative economy like the United States has, those skills are getting to be more and more difficult to acquire if you don't have access early on in K-12 to uh, high quality education. And so uh, my answer is let's go and fix that problem. And I think we will start to see some impacts on uh, income inequality. So I say, what 
is it that the United States has done in the past that has made uh, it possible to escape class, to escape, uh, to, to actually believe that your life can be better than your parents or your grandparents? And again, for me, it goes back to equal access to certain very important elements in life. One is education, one is healthcare. We do need to do more about access to healthcare. Um, my own passion, of course, is education because I saw what it did for my family. So um, I'm actually not even the first PhD in my family. Now, when you look at me and I'm a black woman from Alabama, people are sometimes surprised by that. My aunt was a PhD in Victorian literature. She got her degree at the University of Wisconsin in 1952. She wrote books on Dickens. Now you think what I do is kind of strange for a black person, she wrote books on Dickens, right? Uh, my grandfather went to college. He was a sharecropper's son who decided he was gonna get an education in book learning. He went to Stillman College, a little Presbyterian college in Tuscaloosa, and he made a deal. If he became a minister, they'd let him go to school for free. He became a minister. We have been educated and Presbyterian ever since. So to me, education and my family, education was kind of the holy grail. And when I look these days, at a kid and I say, can I look at your zip code and tell whether you're gonna get a good education? And I say, yes, I can look at your zip code and tell whether you're gonna get a good education. That's where we're falling down. On the issue of uh, racial injustice, uh, after the horrific death of George Floyd and the shock and grief that many Americans experienced, you said that uh, when you grew up in segregated Jim Crow, Alabama, if a black man was shot by a policeman, it wouldn't even have been a footnote in the newspaper. Uh, what, what do you think are some of the key actions necessary to promote racial justice and make our system more fair in that regard? Well, let me start with the, the justice system and policing. And um, clearly, we need to make reforms to the way that we police communities, particularly uh, diverse communities and troubled communities. And um, there are a lot of people who uh, think about uh, more national ways to figure out if there's a bad cop. Uh, the, the cop in the case of George Floyd, I think it had something like 16 or 17 complaints. What, what was he still doing on the force? Uh, it's the fact that uh, if you're gonna treat somebody the way that George Floyd was treated, you have to think of them as less than a human being to do that. And so clearly our training and our reforms of police, uh, it's important. And, and by the way, I'm a, an advocate I don't believe in defunding the police, but I would like to see us think about what should the police be doing and what might others be doing. Um, is domestic violence something that needs more than policing? Because we know that that's a more complex issue. Uh, when you go into a community that is uh, troubled, uh, how can you get the support of the community to isolate the really bad elements? So there's a lot of work that needs to be done done in policing and in justice reform. Clearly the fact that so many black males are incarcerated is uh, a sign that something's wrong. And so I'm for reform of all of that. When I think about race, I think about the fact that we were, there's a, the United States of America birth defect, slavery. And uh, we've never quite been able to deal with what that meant. Uh, I am, my, my DNA is 40% European. My grandmother, my great grandmother was the daughter of the slave owner. Race is visceral in a way in America that almost nothing else is. Don't get me wrong, there's plenty of pain to go around in the way that Jewish Americans were treated, that um, Asian Americans were treated, that uh, certainly Mexican Americans were treated, people of uh, Latinx people have been treated, no, no doubt about it. But race is different because of its roots in slavery, where in order to enslave human beings, you had to create a notion that they were less than human. And even our constitution counted slaves as three fifths of a man initially. So how do we go and deal with that set of, uh, that, that set of birth marks as we move forward? Now, I would be the first to say, people who say we've made no progress, come on. I stood before a portrait of Benjamin Franklin and took an oath of office to that constitution, by the way, that once counted my ancestors three-fifths of a man. 
sworn in by a Jewish woman Supreme Court Justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was my neighbor. And I thought, you know, what would Ben Franklin have thought of this? Well, you know, he probably would never have been able to imagine it. So yes, we have made progress. But we have to see how we can make progr more progress. And I think it begins with each and every one of us. Um, I've, I've asked all of my friends, you know, I don't, I don't want recrimination. I don't want white people to feel guilty. I don't need your guilt. What I need is your commitment to trying to get to a place that when someone walks in the room who is black, you don't think you know what they think. You don't think you know what their background is. You don't think you know how good they are, bad they are at various things. In other words, even if we're not colorblind and we're not likely to be, let's act as if we are. And then let's talk about the impact of race on health outcomes, the impact of race on educational outcomes, and see then how can we address uh, these, these very deep uh, issues that we face. Your, your 2017 best-selling book, uh, Democracy, uh, was an insightful look at the global struggle for democracy. Uh, three years later, uh, the challenges you wrote about seem to me more relevant than ever. Uh, it seems like uh, the current COVID-19 crisis, if anything, has exacerbated uh, what you call in the book the tendency for uh, isolationism. Uh, how do you think democracy is faring? Yeah. Well, I am, um, I always am optimistic about democracy because uh, we don't have any other answer to how human beings are going to organize themselves in a way that accords with human dignity. Um, but democracy is really hard. So what are we asking people to do? We're saying we want you to trust these abstractions, these institutions, elections, and constitutions, and, uh, and institutions like courts to to actually protect your interest and your values rather than your tribe or your village or violence to do it. And so it's very hard and it takes a long time to get there. Those institutions um, are straining right now under the stresses uh, of uh, the pandemic. Uh, they're straining under the stresses as you've just raised of racial and social injustice, but there isn't any alternative to people being able to govern themselves in this way. Ask yourself, uh, would you rather say, okay, so we'll just, we'll just lay our bets on a benign authoritarian to make things better for us. First of all, you have to count on them to be benign and you have to count on generations of them to be benign because there's no way to get rid of a dictator once you've got one. The good thing about democracy is it gives you the means to peacefully change power. And that's the most important element of democracy. Yes, it's very, very hard right now. But I think if, again, each and every one of us recognizes that democracy is not a spectator sport, you have to commit yourself to being uh, willing to play your own role then the aggregated roles uh, will, will come to mean something. Condi, as a, as a former Secretary of State, what advice would you give the next Secretary of State uh, in terms of how to best handle U.S. foreign affairs, especially now during a global pandemic? I, I would ask uh, the next Secretary of State and the next several Secretaries of State to realize uh, what a special role the United States has played in the world uh, since the end of World War II. You know, after World War II, um, a group of people, not all of them American, um, got together and they sort of looked at the world that they had just left behind, a world that had been uh, a war that had come out of um, violent conflict over resources, a, a war that had come out of an, a Great Depression in which the economy, the international economy, was considered a zero-sum game. My growth had to come at your expense. Uh, a, a world in which uh, great powers just conflicted over territory or over resources, they decided we could do better. And they tried to create uh, institutions like the United Nations on the, the political side and the IMF and the World Bank on the economic side to create, let's call it a global commons, where we would all see our interest as interlocked. 
When I look around the world today, and you mentioned the response to COVID-19, I have never seen the revenge of the sovereign state like this. Uh, it has been my citizens, my PPE, uh, my borders, my travel bans. The international institutions have been pushed to the sidelines. And uh, I really hope that we're going to recognize, as I think we did after the horrors of 9-11 and after the last financial crisis, that we're better in this if we can find international cooperation to deal with these challenges. I'll give you one example where I really hope we get international cooperation. If and when we're fortunate enough to find a vaccine for COVID-19, I hope it's not the Hunger Games. I hope it's not whoever got there first. Uh, our citizens get access and the rest of you, well, good luck to you. Because the truth of the matter is almost all of the challenges that we're going to face, pandemics, climate change, terrorism, are borderless. And if we think of ourselves first, then we're going to miss the opportunity to work with others to make them safer and ourselves safer in the process. The United States after World War II took that view. And I know it carried a lot of burdens, but it also carried a lot of uh, benefits and successes. Well, Thank you very much, Condi, for, for your insights. It was really great talking to you, and I will look forward to seeing you on campus when the pandemic is over and life is back to normal and to continue our conversation. Yes, and if I may say to, my stu this to, to our students out there, I know this is not the college experience that you had expected, uh, but try to remember that uh, we're all in this together. Keep studying hard. Uh, this is a different experience, but hopefully you'll stay in touch with all of your friends, even if virtually, and we'll see you back on campus soon. Great. Thank you, Pandi. Thank you. Our next speaker is Larry Diamond. Larry is a senior fellow at both the Hoover Institution and the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, and was for many years the director of the Center on Democracy Development and Rule of Law. Larry is a Bass University Fellow in undergraduate education at Stanford, which is a big honor for professors here because it is a program that recognizes faculty for extraordinary contribution to undergraduate education. Larry is a leading scholar in the field of democracy studies, having published many books and articles on the topic, and is the founding co-editor of the Journal of Democracy. His most recent book analyzes the challenges confronting liberal democracy in the United States and, uh, and around the world, and offers an agenda for strengthening and defending democracy at home and abroad. In addition to his great scholarship, Larry has also advised agencies dealing with governance and development. And for those of you in the audience interested, he is teaching a massive open online course on democratic development. So welcome, Larry, and it is great to have you. OK, uh, thank you, Ron. And uh, it's a great honor to be with you and to follow uh, my distinguished colleague at Hoover, our new director, Condi Rice. We're really thrilled to have her in this new role. I want to say, uh, Ron, uh, with the election approaching in uh, exactly uh, seven weeks from today, uh, the short remarks I'm going to give are not the ones I would have given six months or a year ago uh, when I would have preferred to talk about the longer term challenges of reforming and depolarizing American democracy. We are facing uh, the prospect, Ron, of the most controversial and crisis ridden election in 150 years, at least since the Hayes Tilden election, presidential election of 1876. And uh, we've got seven weeks to try and buffer uh, our democracy against the fallout of this and to try and preempt. Uh, some of the worst and potentially most destructive uh, elements of crisis and failure. Neither the administration nor the Congress has done nearly enough to prepare for this election and to try and prevent it from becoming a crisis. But as I'll say in a moment, in classic American fashion, uh, civil society is stepping up to try and fill some of the void. So the first uh, imperative is to try to prevent a crisis. Um, as my colleague, I'll return to his work in a minute, Nate Persily from Law, Poli-Sci, and Communication, 
um, has repeatedly stressed with some of his other colleagues who specialize uh, in election law and administration have repeatedly argued that Congress should have appropriated, and some members of Congress sought, two to three billion dollars to assist the states to modernize their voting machines, to harden their electoral administration infrastructure against new waves of assault that we know are coming uh, now as we sit here from Russia, uh, and to ensure that no vote in the United States ever takes place that doesn't leave a paper trail so that it can be audited and recounted if necessary. And we still have way too many voting machines that don't do that. Uh, I'm gonna speak now about a few urgent imperatives that I think can help to um, preempt or contain disaster. The first one um, might be a little counterintuitive, uh, but it's one that Nate's been emphasizing in his work Everyone who can vote in person, who feels physically well enough uh, to uh, come out to the polls, ideally in advance of election day, if your community has uh, uh, early voting at designated places, should try and vote in person. Um, this will uh, reduce the strain on mail-in balloting since um, a lot of states just haven't been able to acquire the equipment and infrastructure that's, that would enable them to count mail-in ballots very rapidly. And we're still struggling in several states like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania to get the legislatures to allow uh, the states to start counting mail-in ballots before election day so that we don't have to wait days or potentially weeks to uh, count the mail-in ballots which could be uh, a pathway to very serious crisis. Nate personally uh, co-chairs with Charles Stewart at MIT, something called the Stanford MIT Healthy Elections Project. I hope many of the students listening will Google that, Stanford MIT Healthy Elections Project, because one of the things they're trying to do is recruit and train young poll workers, young, healthy, robust poll workers to uh, replace the disproportionately elderly poll workers who just don't feel that they can risk uh, the chance, even a modest one, of a COVID transmission on election day. And so they're trying to plug in volunteers uh, to NGOs and directly to election administration uh, efforts that could uh, make use of volunteers to help staff the polls on election day. We need to do much more to protect our voter files, the voter registers from tampering, fraud, and hacking. We know from the Senate Intelligence Committee report that Russia tried to break into uh, the voter rolls, the voter files of every single one of the 50 states in 2016 and succeeded in doing so with 21 of those states. Uh, we don't know what they might be attempting this year, but we do know that even modest and difficult to detect changes in the voter rolls could cause chaos and actually change the outcome uh, on election day by preventing a number of people from voting. There's another amazing NGO, I was just on a conference call with them an hour and a half ago, called Protect Democracy. I urge you to Google them as well, that is doing incredibly innovative work, working with 10 state election administrators to use very sophisticated algorithms and machine learning to analyze patterns of change in, in the voter files to try and detect any sabotage or fraud or even hu human error. We need to do much more to preempt misinformation and disinformation about voting uh, this is something that the Department of Human, uh, Homeland Security should have been doing, that many of the career officials at DHS wanted to be doing uh, and that have been frustrated from doing by higher authorities. Again, it falls to civil society to try and take up this challenge uh, because we haven't had an adequate federal government uh, effort. I want to stress how important it is for us to engage the media and our fellow citizens to understand 
that because of the unprecedented number of mail-in ballots uh, that are going to be cast this year, possibly 40 to 50 percent of every American vote for president will come in by mail. We may not know the winner of the presidential election on November 3rd or 4, 5, or 6. And we need to be patient to wait until all the valid votes are counted. And should any candidate or party or effort try to uh, uh, preempt the process and claim a victory that isn't justified by the full count of the votes, uh, we need to stand together as Americans across party lines to delegitimate that. I have argued uh, in my writing quite passionately uh, in favor of a bill that Senator Marco Rubio uh, introduced a couple months ago that could just spare us the worst election crisis uh, in 150 years. It would postpone the date for certifying the Electoral College uh, vote in each state, uh, the so-called safe harbor rule. It would uh, postpone it from December 8th to January 1st. And instead of December 14th, the Electoral College would then meet on January 2nd. That would give states another 24 days to resolve any disputes around the election and to um, ensure that you know, we aren't tearing each other apart uh, with suspicion before we can fully resolve these disputes. Um, we also, I think, need a standing uh, independent commission that can step in if there is an electoral dispute and try and advise the Congress on how to resolve it. We could well have a situation when the Congress convenes on January 6th to count and certify the electoral vote uh, with competing electoral college slates from several of the battleground states. And uh, we need a neutral arbiter to help uh, resolve this if it happens. We also need to do much more to prevent and halt voter suppression. Uh, as an American citizen, not to mention a scholar of democracy, uh, there's really nothing that makes, that outrages me more than deliberate efforts uh, to try and keep people from voting. We just lost one of the great heroes recently of the American civil rights movement, Congressman uh, John Lewis. Uh, you all know his personal story and you know Condoleezza Rice's personal story. And you know that uh, many people, African-American, white, Latinx and others bled and risked their lives and some of them tragically died to achieve full universal suffrage in the United States. And we absolutely cannot go back uh, from that imperative. So for now, we need to ensure that we monitor uh, activities on the ground and that no one is prevented from voting because of the color of their skin or the presumed uh, voting intention they might have because of the nature of their residence. Uh, when this is over, we need to fully restore the Voting Rights Act, which was diminished in effect by the Supreme Court, which deactivated the requirement uh, that certain states would have to get pre-certification before they could change their voting rules. My time is almost up. Uh, later on, perhaps I'll have time to talk about some of the longer term changes that could help to uh, invigorate and depolarize our democracy. But continuing on the theme of universal suffrage, I wanna close with this. We now have uh, more than 6 million Americans who are forbidden to vote and will not vote this year because they've been convicted of a felony. Nearly or, or slightly more actually uh, than half of these are people who have served their sentences, uh, but still face barriers because of uh, hurdles related to, um, for example, whether they can afford to pay their fines. And of course, as you can imagine, uh, this is not uh, equally racially distributed. Uh, uh, over 7% of African Americans of voting age, I repeat, one in 13 African-Americans of voting age 
is disenfranchised because of a felony conviction, a rate more than four times that of the rest of the population. Uh, this, I think, is un-American, particularly for those who've served their sentences. And we need to um, return to a vision of our country uh, that really involves uh, freedom for all and universal suffrage. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Larry. And uh, next, I am honored to welcome Margaret Levy. Margaret is a professor of political science at Stanford and the director of the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, which is an inspirational center at Stanford that brings together deep thinkers from across fields to advance our understanding of human behavior and of institution. Uh, I personally know a number of path-breaking books that were conceptualized and written while spending a year at this center. Margaret is a prolific scholar having written seven books and many dozens of articles. She's a world expert in comparative political economy with focus on how to improve the quality of government. She has received too many awards and honors to be mentioning in a short introduction here, but I will mention she is the winner of the 2019 Johann Skype Prize, which is deemed as the political science equivalent of the Nobel Prize. She won it and I quote, for having laid the foundations of our understanding of why citizens accept state coercion by combining theoretical acumen and historical knowledge. So welcome, Margaret, and thank you very much for joining today. Thank you. Thank you. It's really a, a privilege to be here, and I welcome all the students who are in the audience. In a sense, I'm going to be echoing what Condi Rice had to say, not about my personal history, but in seeking a new social contract. My major focus recently has been really on how to create a new moral political economic framework. This means thinking about what it means to have a set of institutional arrangements that not only embody an explicit set of values, the moral part of the moral political economy, but also ensure first democratic practices that work for the contemporary era and second, government economy interactions that promote the well being of the whole population and the earth, while also encouraging innovation and productivity. Now, there are many, many moving parts to this problem, so I will focus on only a few. In particular, I'm going to think about what this means for a redistribution of power in relationship to various domains of equality and inequality. And I'm going to be drawing on work I've been doing recently, um, a small book I've just completed with Federica Car Caragatti, as well as work I'm doing on America as a developing country, maybe question mark there, that I'm doing with our next speaker, Tino Cuellar, and Stanford professor Barry Weingast. And finally, a work I'm beginning to do on political inequality with Tim Besley and Pablo Baramendi in a larger project that also involves Deborah Satz. Okay, so I'm gonna focus on government, corporations, and citizens in thinking about this question. When we think about governmental power or the power, the limits of governmental power, which is really how I'm thinking about it, there's the overarching influence of special interests, particularly as they have evolved in capitalist democracies. Now, if they're more in some than in others, depending on such factors as campaign fi finance, lobbying, and other ways in which influence is regulated. But even more interesting to me is the structural dependence of government on a functioning economy and the key players in that economy, which means certain corporations and firms have an ordinate bargaining power, whether or not they contribute to campaigns or whether or not they lobby. I, and that's because a government doesn't want them to move their uh, factories or their tax bases to another country. So there's a lot of power, and we're very dependent on our major corporations in terms of ensuring that there's full employment or relatively good employment and productivity. But when other con conflicting concerns intervene, national governments will in fact um, go against the interests of the corporations. One of the examples I often cite is from the 1930s when the national government changed sides in terms of unions um, and their strikes. 
in the face of the combination of depression and the potential of a, a feared communist revolution in the US. What also mattered in this case, of course, was a set of political leaders who were willing to step up to the plate on these questions. National security issues obviously can also affect the kind of the way in which corporate power can actually be exercised, as Trump is arguing with the Chinese right now. And in the US at least, we have two, we've developed two sets of arrangements that help bring other voices into the mix um, to sort of help the government um, bring other voices in than the corporate ones. One is federalism, which ensures that local voices have a role. And another, which Tino and Barry and I develop in our work, it really has to do with the agencies that are embedded in a series of administrative laws that require them to act or at least listen to a wider variety of opinions than the special interest and to justify their actions in terms of the collective good. Okay, so that's the way in which government power is affected and limited. We could also, of course, have a discussion, which I'll say for another day, about what should be the limits on government power itself. Let me talk more explicitly now about corporate power. What we've seen in the last decades are new forms of monopoly and monopsony, which is the control monopoly over the labor, over labor power, have arisen with the rise of the tech companies, gig work, et cetera. But the rules under which they are operating are really for another era and for another type of country, company. So we really have rules and laws that are mismatched to the kinds of corporations that we have in place. The Great Recession of 2008 led to some revision of, of banking and financial rules, but we still need more because those institute, those companies, those corporations, those interests also evolved over the last decades and they have not adequately been confronted. Those of you who read the New York Times might have seen Sunday a revisit of Milton Friedman's argument that the only responsibility of corporations is to shareholders. Lots of corporate and other voices now questioning that as that piece showed, and as the Business Roundtable did some months ago. At CASPIS, at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, we have been considering these questions as part of our Moral Political Economy project. Though the real leader in this effort, I would argue, is the British Academy project on the Purposeful Corporation led by Colin Mayer. And what these projects are coming up with, these working groups and thinking is coming up with, with a new framework of laws, a new, if you will, social contract between government, citizens, and the corporation about what their real commit commitment should be. Should it be to all stakeholders or only to shareholders? But raising Friedman's perspective here raises the bigger issue. What we, ha what we are living in is a mindset that's been created by a particular political economic framework and the kinds of arguments about and assumptions about humans on which it is based. So we're assumed to be narrow, self-interested individuals who are completely rational. Now, I could argue with every bit of that. We are not just self-interested. We often care about many others. We're, oft, we're actually social animals, not just individualistic. And we are certainly incompletely rational. But because of this framework, we have come to believe that the economic, that the economy that we live under, even the political institutions that we live in under, based on those assumptions and developed based on those assumptions, is natural and given, and it's neither of those things. The framework is mutable, but it means shaking up beliefs, one of the hardest problems we face in social science. And so I want to turn to citizen power, which really gets at this question. Larry's already talked about, and so did Condi, about getting rid of voter suppression and actually equalizing the vote. But that is only part of the problem, not an insignificant part of the problem, but definitely a major part of the problem and only part of it. The deeper problem, I think, is the problematic beliefs so much of the population holds. And it's not just in the US, it's all over. And we can, we can blame social media, but it's been a problem that 
predates, and I could document that, um, all of the new social forms of social media that we have. So they're problematic beliefs, some of them just simple disagreements, but some of them misunderstandings of what government should and can do to pe improve people's lives. And there's problematic beliefs or very different beliefs about what the world is really like and who is to blame for its ills. What I want to emphasize in my last moments here is the different issues for different sets of people around thinking about beliefs. The first has to do with how policies are framed to us. And that's not an easy problem to deal with, but it's the easiest of the ones I'm going to lay out. We can present things in a way that appeals to the values people have. We know that Republicans, there's a whole argument in psychology that actually Larry first pointed me to about moral values and that Republicans and Democrats, for example, tend to emphasize different things, even though they share a lot of common values. And so how you frame a policy really depends if you're gonna get buy into it in part on whether you appeal to what people really care about. And that, as I said, is a framing issue, which should be relatively simple compared to the others. The second if issue really has to do with information and misinformation. But even when we're talking about facts or real information, you have to make it salient, given that most people are not attentive. So in recent days, for example, the Postal Service sent out a postcard telling people about how to vote by mail, which is full of misinformation, not probably purposeful, but it's misinformation because it doesn't deal with the variations in different states and among different groups. But people have to be paying attention, one, to the postcard for it to make a difference, and then to all the people who are trying to counter that postcard to give them the correct information about the vote. Number three are the group of people who won't be persuaded by any fact or argument. I recently heard um, a reporter, a TV reporter, talk about following the woman who McCain chastised about her birther beliefs, claiming that Obama was not born in the US. He said that McCain chastised her during a campaign event when he was running for president. The reporter found followed her out of the room and discovered that there was actually no piece of evidence that would persuade her to think otherwise. Those, that group of people, one, we don't know how many there are. We don't even know if it is absolutely impossible to persuade them, but we know that that is gonna be a really difficult problem. And the final group, which gives me some hope, is that we have evidence that certain kinds of institutional and arrangements can actually change, actually alter beliefs. My professors at Bryn Mawr College were uh, Peter Backrack and Morton Barrett's, who, who believed in something called non-decision making. It's not direct suppression that keeps us uh, necessarily from expressing our voices, expressing our views, but an environment, e.g. segregation, where your voice is discounted, if not outright discard, disregarded, so you don't even speak up. And it takes major events, sometimes like the racial justice movement we've recently been experiencing, to get people to speak up. My own work with John Alquist, my former student, looks at a set of institutional arrangements, governance arrangements, we look at unions, but there are many democracies of varying kinds. And we look at these as a way to understand institutional arrangements that will evoke from people interest beyond their narrow self-interest. And we looked at it in unions where the reason for a union is to be, to serve people's narrow economic interest, to serve its members' narrow economic interest. But in, even in those cases, in some unions, a set of institutional arrangements that were really about democratic participation, transparency, challenging information, so that until everybody got some consensus about it, that that led to a situation in which you were able to evoke from people costly behavior, often very costly behavior, on behalf of others often distant others, often strangers who could never reciprocate. 
but you acted in the interest of a larger community, acted in a larger set of interest of others. So if we want to create a more equal and inclusive society, at least part of where we have to put our attention and our effort are the structures and institutions that shape and allocate power. We have the analytic tools. That's what a wonderful institution like Stanford enables us to gather. We now need the political will and the strategies to do that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Margaret. And uh, our final speaker before we move to the Q&A part is Mariano Florentino Cuellar, Justice of the California Supreme Court and a professor of law at Stanford. Justice Cuellar was appointed by Senator Jerry Brown and unanimously confirmed with the highest possible rating of exceptionally well qualified by the Judicial Nominations Commission. My good friend Tino's story is remarkable and inspiring. Tino was born in Matamoros, Mexico, a border city biking distance from the US. When he was 14, the Cuellar family moved to the US to another border city in California where he graduated from Calexico High School. Tino then went on to earn his undergraduate degree from Harvard, his JD law degree from Yale, and his PhD in political science from Stanford. Over the next two decades, Tino was a professor of law at Stanford, served as a special assistant to President Obama for justice and regulatory policy, and came back to Stanford to hold university leadership position, including directing Stanford's FSI. I'm grateful to Tino for taking a short break from his busy work at the Supreme Court to talk with the Stanford community. So welcome, Tino. Thank you, Ron. It's an honor to be here and I appreciate the chance to talk to everybody. All of you who are still on, I really appreciate your staying on. I'm gonna take about 10 minutes to share a few perspectives. But let me start by acknowledging that this is a really confusing time. It's challenging, it's difficult. Frankly, no one can do justice to all the contentions, tensions, pretensions, conventions associated with the current moment or with American constitutional democracy. But I can try to give you a sense of the journey we're on if we start in the right place. So imagine it's 1952 and the Korean War is raging. At home, you hear the radio uh, playing K-Star's song, Wheel of Fortune, with words like, will the arrow point my way? Will this be my day? But meanwhile, there's a big strike looming affecting the production of steel across the United States. Now, President Truman at this point famously prepares to seize control of the steel mills in the midst of the Korean War from the private sector and essentially to order labor back to work. But in the famous Youngstown case, which I recently cited actually in one of my opinions, the US Supreme Court says, no, Mr. President, you don't have inherent power to seize factories or portions of the economy on national security grounds. Now this case is often taken as a poignant example of what American constitutional democracy is all about. Separated branches of government, the power of courts to stop lawless action, the fact that security concerns are not a trump card in a major legal and policy dispute. And the relevance of this case to the current moment is hard to miss. We have charged battles over the president's power, over the government's role in the economy, tensions with China. It would frankly take willful blindness not to see the powerful connections between economic growth, geopolitical influence, domestic prosperity. But this Youngstown case has a pretty complicated legacy in part because at least some of the limits it imposed may have turned out to be a bit more pliable than initially apparent. And frankly, the straightforward rule of law story one could find um, in Youngstown coexists with difficult legacies of the time, like the fervor of investigations inspired by then Senator Joseph McCarthy or the struggle for civil rights in the South. So what I wanna do in the next few minutes is delve more deeply into this and remind us of really what most of us already know at some level, which is that in any society, including ours, weaving together constitutional democracy with the reality of daily life is more intricate. And I wanna highlight in particular four ways in which these complexities are apparent. First, constitutional democracy is not primarily about removing conflict, but about channeling it. 
We Americans spend about 1.7% of our annual GDP on legal services. The rule of law does take skill, principle, and judgment from lawyers, from jurors, from judges, but we shouldn't assume that legal reasoning or some kind of technocratic yardstick will ever completely remove divided interests and differing views about education, about the role of religion, how to reform the police, how America should play a role in the world. In some ways, disagreement is essential to democracy. It's part of what makes us believe in democracy. What we can do more realistically is build on what the US achieved in the first half of the 20th century, which is to limit corruption and create enough agreement about core institutions, about basic norms of democracy, so that we can channel disputes more productively. As we build a mix of norms about civic life, legal arrangements, capacity in our institutions, we're actually building a more elaborate economy, greater capacity for geopolitical influence, and greater capacity to change. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Second, constitutional democracy depends only in limited but important ways on courts and what they do. Courts are a critical piece of how we govern, but they don't do it alone. Let me illustrate that with an example involving the segregation of African Americans in public schools. After Brown v. Board of Education, a case that was decided shortly after Youngstown, the percentage of black students in the South who attended schools that were at least 50% white increased from 0% to eventually 44%, peaking around 1989. But by 2011, the percentage was 23%. As court-ordered remedies against segregation did their thing, many families left districts that were integrating for the suburbs with separate school districts of which America has about 14,000 school districts. That larger context shows how complex is the interplay of life and law, how difficult it is to just rely on court decisions to achieve social change, or to simply honor the rights and responsibilities that we have under our law. What's more, courts enforce protections often meant to slow down or frustrate the speed of decision-making. We do that in principle to honor social commitments meant to promote deliberation, and to protect minority points of view. But the resulting system depends to some extent on the willingness of people in public life to do things like treat the opposition as legitimate, to act in ways that won't damage the legitimacy of our entire system by avoiding chronic lying to the public, to accept norms from which court judgments so often get their power in the first place. If we don't expect that this happens, and if it doesn't happen, it's very difficult for anything to actually get done in our system. Third, American constitutional democracy is powerfully shaped by two curiously interdependent themes. Federalism, the existence of states like Arkansas, Alabama, New York, California, and then the change that arises from geopolitical and social developments. So one way we've kept government from ever getting too removed from the day-to-day -day life of people around us is federalism. It's also how we've assimilated territory over time in a way that lets us govern, however, imperfectly. This means a major part of our constitutional tradition is the intricate dance of federal and state power. The federal constitution is the supreme law of the land. Everybody, whether you work in a state court or a federal court, has to honor it. But the state courts are by far where the bulk of judging actually happens. We have over 60 million cases in state courts. That's in 2016, and by one estimate, that's about 96% of all the cases in America. Even if Congress may have the power to tie the hands of the federal courts when it comes to considering constitutional claims, Congress lacks the power to block state courts from protecting federal constitutional rights. Then there's geopolitics and its close cousin of social and technological change. Both serve as a major impetus for reform, for debates, for democratic participation, for disagreements. So it was in the 19th century when railroads and the nationwide and global trade implications of those technologies created massive public concern about regulation, about trusts. So it was too with how the struggle for civil rights and basic dignity for African and Americans played out in the South. And so it was today when ultimately we have these massive discussions about the proper role of policing. Fourth, the measure of any system of government is not only what commitments it keeps, but what problems it can solve. 
and that takes adaptation and change. Think about the big challenges we're facing geopolitically, cooling the planet while we meet growing demand for energy, getting Americans ready for more technological change and for more disruption in median incomes that have remained pretty stagnant since the 1970s, keeping Americans ready and able to take part in democracy, keeping Americans safe in a world of changing powers and risks, nurturing health, reforming policing. The constitutional democracy that becomes brittle at home and fragile abroad is the one that consistently loses capacity to take on these challenges. Some adaptability is key to solving these problems. That depends not only on leaving flexibility for democracy to play out, but on ensuring the integrity of the democratic process. It also means that American constitutional democracy is ultimately not only about stability and continuity, but it's about keeping civic life limber and sufficiently buttressed by people who care about more than just their own interests so we don't lose the capacity to build and solve problems. Take these together and it becomes quite clear that our record is pretty mixed right now. We provide more process and less arbitrariness than many countries. Certainly countries are scale. We adjudicate millions of cases. We have courts that can say no to the president's lawyers and can convict cops who use excessive force or powerful uh, people who abuse the public trust but we incarcerate large and staggering numbers of people. We let access to justice too often be a paper guarantee and outside the sky can be orange. It's a daunting and discordant picture, but it's worth remembering that to some extent, this has always been the challenge. Let me close by sharing a memory from three years ago when I had the enormous privilege of welcoming about a thousand people who had just taken the oath to become American citizens as I once did many years ago. Here's what I said on that day. Whatever else you remember from this beautiful day and all that's happening in the country right now, I want you to remember that democracy, equality, and the rule of law can never be taken for granted. They must be defended in what you teach your kids, in what you do and say to keep at bay the cynics, in the effort you make to pay the right amount of taxes or take seriously that jury summons from state or federal court, in how you share your story, with and learn from people around you who've never known somebody of your background and how you bring light to those in the darkness of ignorance. Through these and countless actions, democracy, equality, and the rule of law must be defended, not just today or tomorrow, but time and again, without compromise and without hesitation. That's at least as true today as it was three years ago. Well, that was great. Thank you so much, Tino. And uh, all right, let's turn to questions from the audience. We have a question here. Um, and the first question is for Larry Diamond. Um, there's two questions. What is the name of the MOOC you are teaching now? And around how many days after the election date do you predict we will have confidence in the results of the vote? Okay, uh, the MOOC I'm teaching is Comparative Democratic Development. You can find it on the edX uh, platform. And thank you, Stanford University, for helping to support that. Uh, it's very hard to know how long a close election that is disputed or uncertain because of, um, you know, uh, some critical swing states hanging in the ballot, uh, balance, it's very hard to know how long uh, the uncertainty could go on. I think it's likely to be a few days, but, you know, if we have something uh, approaching, uh, you know, even the closeness of 2016, where 77,000 votes uh, determined the winner's margin in three states that put the winner over the top in the Electoral College, it could be much longer. So um, uh, there's a lot of time between uh, November 3rd and the safe harbor deadline of, of December 8th. But if it's fought in the courts, Tino might have a view on this if he can offer it. But if it's waged in the courts, that could be a very extended battle. Thank you, for Pro Professor Diamond. And we have a question for um, Margaret Levy. Margaret, um, how do we increase the number of people who will consider the interests of others, even if it's not in their own self-interest? <laughs> Great question. 
um, and one I think a lot about all the time. So the, uh, the key, it seems to me, is in changing a number of our institutional arrangements and governance arrangements, because there are a number of reasons why people don't act in a more community spirited way, except around charities. Um, and we are a, re a relatively charitable population, but that's, that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about actions which can be quite costly and which really are creating what what I call an expanded community of faith, where we begin to recognize that our destinies are entwined with these very distant others uh, who may or may not be able to reciprocate. And so the argument I make is that it really, and that I've demonstrated is that it really has to do with institutional arrangements, with governance arrangements that can be changed. So when I, I, I mentioned my two uh, professors as an undergraduate who inspired me so much in thinking about these questions, and what they really saw were a set of institutions that inhibited the voice of people, not just the voter suppression institutions, but the ways in which things were set up so that you really believed if you were a poor person or a person of color or a woman, that your voice just wasn't going to be heard, even if you tried to raise it. So why even bother? So we need to create institutional arrangements that really show people that and engages them, actually engages them, is a proactive process of engagement, of talking about information and its sources and challenges it so people argue about it and hear why they disagree, and then gives people a real choice and decision point in which they can decide whether they're going to engage in some action or another. And in that process, you begin to recognize that there's a larger community if you care about issues like the environment or about peace or about social justice. And that your best, that your fate is really entwined with those who um, you have to help because they're for, but the grace of God could you be. So this next question is for Professor Cuellar, and the question is, what can the courts do to enforce environmental regulation of corporations to further democratic principles? It's a great question. I would just note that uh, to some extent, we can expect, we can, we can hope for courts to do what they've done for many decades, which is to let the part of our democracy, which sounds most like the textbook version of what probably Professor Diamond teaches his students near the beginning of his class to actually work, which is to say a democratically elected legislature with no voter suppression comes together, debates an issue, enacts legislation, an executive branch implements it. And when disagreements arise, either about how much power the agency has to implement the law or whether a particular individual or corporation has been flouting the law, you go to court and the court's role is to protect our social commitments. And those commitments include protecting the environment. That sounds very simple. It's complicated, obviously, but it's worth remembering, especially at a time when so much distrust of government exists, that we would never have gotten to the point of reducing massive amounts of particulate matter from the air if basically some version of that process that Professor Diamond might sort of lay out as an idealized version of what democracy is didn't work to some extent in our country. I would also note that, well, it's not the court's role to make environmental policy, but instead to read our laws and implement them. It is, um, it is striking to see how many state jurisdictions and their state courts have decided that they wanted to go in a direction of protecting the environment that might go even further than what the federal government has decided to do. So I guess I would say, some of that work ultimately has to do with designing the right laws, having the right information, the right data, relying on the work of people like David Lobel on the Stanford faculty. But a lot of it then has to do with our expectations and norms around the people and institutions that actually have to honor social commitments and make sure that they're not just paper guarantees. And we have the next question for um, Larry Diamond. Larry, you said that you originally wanted to discuss longer term plans on how to depolarize the nation going forward. Could you talk about this briefly? I was just starting to type an answer to that because I didn't know if we'd get to it. But uh, I'm a big fan of ranked choice voting. I think that um, people are getting a little exhausted with only having two political parties to choose from that have for, for, for which a vote could be meaningful. 
And with ranked choice voting, every vote counts and people can rank their preferences. And if nobody gets a majority of uh, first preference votes, uh, their vote can be uh, transferred to their second preference. And these transfers keep happening uh, until someone gets a majority of the vote. This is the method that Oakland and San Francisco use to select their mayors. It's how London Breed got elected mayor of San Francisco last time. Uh, the state of Maine uh, in an historic uh, 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 strike for reform, political reform in the United States, adopted ranked choice voting for most of their elections. And it, it was very consequential in a, um, a congressional election last time. It may make the difference in deciding the senatorial election this time. So it encourages everybody to vote, to vote their heart on a first uh, preference, uh, you know, maybe to vote strategically on a second preference. And then you can't just drill down to a narrow uh, constituency. You have to reach for a wider constituency to attract second preference votes. And that leads many of us to think that it might at least have some mitigating effect on political polarization. Uh, obviously, I favor uh, independent commissions like we now have in California to redraw uh, congressional and state legislative district boundaries. And I think there's some campaign finance reforms that we can adopt until maybe we get Tino on the U.S. Supreme Court and change the interpretation of uh, what's allowed and disallowed in campaign finance. But uh, campaign finance voucher, vouchers like Seattle uses, I think, uh, have some promise. Thank Larry, you, Larry. I'm surprised you didn't mention some of the um, experiments that are going on that Jim Fishkin and others are running as well, which bring people together in a... Please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who is also a professor at Stanford, but have, have been bringing people together who are very polarized. And the consequence of their talking to each other over a concerted period of time, and in a in a setting where they actually can hold on to their opinions, they're not like being told they have to get rid of them. Um, it actually leads to greater understanding and a decrease in the, not a decrease in the kind of conflict that Tino was talking about, which is the very healthy part of a of a political democracy but gets rid of the sort of intolerance and um, the polarization. So trying to think about how to scale that and to make something of that that could really work in a bigger scale is, is worth contemplating. Right, I will just say that Jim has been working with Professor uh, Ashish Goel and MSNE to yeah, automate the moderating of uh, small group discussions so that we can scale it up. And anyone who's interested could just go to America in one room to read more about it. And I, and I will make, by the way, some further readings available after this uh, okay. event so that uh, participants and the students can, can go ahead and, and get, delve deeper into some of these issues. Well, have them read Margaret's two professors, Backrack and Barrett's. That's a good place to start. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, and I think we have time for one last question, and this is for Justice Cuellar. You mentioned that the law can only do so much for social change. The rest has to come from changes within the people. But how can the law work with citizens to foster social change? It's an excellent question. Uh, well, I guess I would say that there's almost always an interplay between the attitudes, the cultures, the values of a population, and ultimately what laws they're therefore able to enact, whether they're laws about civil rights and inclusion or about education or about criminal justice, and ultimately the way that the law affects the expectations that people have about what government does and how it does it. So sometimes the very effort of galvanizing a coalition, getting people elected, petitioning a legislature can create not only legal change, but also crucially a sense of where the power is and what it is that people can do to affect change. That, that sense of agency that our system is sort of premised on making possible to people is, and this you know, taps a little bit into Margaret's work, is almost as important as the legal change itself. Now, once the legal change is achieved, of course, 
this is a really crucial piece of the puzzle. You, you want to have institutions that are about fidelity, that are about honoring that, that are about making that meaningful. And that, that will always require a very different kind of engagement than just the mobilization piece. It will require people who are willing to take a step back and to say, I'm a fiduciary for the whole system. It's not my role to promote a particular agenda or goal. It's my role to make sure that we honor the commitments we've made. Because if we don't, then it becomes really difficult for people to believe that all that agency and all that effort and all that coalition building is meaningful. So I guess what I'm suggesting is that the law plays a crucial role, but some of that role is ultimately like getting people to orient themselves and figure out what role do they want to play in a function of democracy. And then when you're called upon to play one of those more neutral, more fiduciary roles, not just as a judge, but as a juror, for example, or as a concerned citizen that says, I really, really wanted to win this election. I expected that my party would win the election, but we lost. And it's important for me to be able to say that and to give people a sense that fair's fair, that you're going to be able to do that. Well, thank you very much, Condi, Larry, Margaret, and Tino for making this really such a wonderful event. Uh, next you. week, we will have a conversation about some of the challenges posed by COVID-19 and what policymakers can do about it. And uh, thank you all for joining and hope to see you all next week. Thank you, thank everybody. You. Thank you. Bye.